Well, thanks everybody for coming. This is kind of a treat to get to have this conversation with you. And it's especially a treat to be in an Ollie space and not have to do all the talking for the next <laughs> two hours. So I'm really grateful that you came. Um, uh, I think when Jesse introduced this idea to me, I thought it was really terrific where um, much of what I've presented to you is my understanding of the 1960s based primarily on historical scholarship, you know, how people have looked back at the decade and tried to define what are its major themes, what were its political struggles, and what was its legacy. But I would really love to hear about your own experiences and understandings of really what happened in the 1960s and how it matters for more contemporary um, social and political um, movements, I guess I would say. And um, I don't, like, I kind of want to hear everything, <laughs> so and whatever you're willing to share. So I, um, um, I guess maybe if you don't mind, I don't know anybody's name. <laughs> so if you could maybe introduce yourself and uh, just say a little bit about what you were doing between the years approximately of 1960 and 1969. And maybe we can just go around. Okay. I don't know, should we pass the, pass the torch? <laughs> Um, well, I would say the 60s were my defining time. I started, what is your name? I'm Mary Lou Sortes, <laughs> and I started Berkeley in 1960 when the fraternity and sorority sister systems were really big. Uh, they had just been somewhat impacted by people demonstrating for the, uh, before I got there with the House on American Activities mm -hmm. Committee in San Francisco. So there was a whole group that was already really socially conscious. Uh, but in the four years I was undergraduate, it changed incredibly. Uh, it went to from all of us wearing madras dresses and saddle shoes to wearing everything possible that wasn't that. Mm -hmm. um, and in just the whole mood changing and being much more politically aware uh, in a lot of different ways. I was thinking about this before I came over. I stayed on in 1964 to 65 to get my teaching credential, and in the fall of 1964, the free speech movement started. And I was actually walking through Sather Gate when Mario Savio stood up on his chair for the first time. Um, I looked over at this crazy guy with the wild hair, and I didn't really think about anything. But within a month after that, I was out demonstrating with high heels because I was student teaching, and we had to look. I was student teaching high school, and we were supposed to look a little bit older than our, what we really were. Um, we were told in, uh, well, our student teaching program told us that if we got arrested, we would never teach in California mm. because you couldn't have an arrest record. And so some of us were very careful to demonstrate outside <laughs> the building where other of our friends marched in. and. Um, one gal called us who had been arrested for demonstrating um, and it, they wanted a free speech to most people at that time meant that they wanted to say in decisions that were made for students. Um, before that, administration was sort of like a god and there were people who wanted to advertise their organizations and that sort of thing who were not allowed to advertise that. And so that was the beginning of that whole thing. But the movement and the social action continued in the 70s. Um, as I said, one time one girl called us who had been arrested, my roommate and I, and she um, said, could we find her a bail bondsman? And just at that, just after she, we hung up with her, my father called who was on a business trip to New York and said, what am I hearing about? What's going on at Berkeley? And my first words were, how do I find a bail bondsman? <laughs> I think he probably, you know, aged 20 years at that, po that point. Uh, but it was a very exciting place to be at that time. Uh, after my student teaching year, I did come back to Southern California, but went back to Berkeley in 1968. I think what I got out of that was that I really firmly believe people can make a big difference in the world. And I think a lot of our generation, or at least friends that I've had, felt that way after being able to stand up and say we don't like something or we want things to change and that went along with demonstrating against Vietnam, demonstrating eventually for women's rights and um, other things such as that. I and my husband too have always had felt a, a need to be involved and to, to express ourselves, get involved in politics or get involved in other social groups and I'm not sure generations after the 60s had quite the same push that I feel like 
I had. I'm um, trying to remember if there was anything else that went on. Well, the music was absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I even look back today, you could still understand the words, but there was everything from the folk music to the Beatles to um, other groups after that. Um, and I love the whole thing. I mean, that was, I'm sure other generations love their music too. And of course, my parents like big band and that kind of thing. But I mean, I still, I still listen to that today. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, the, Vietnam really was a big deal. Yeah. And in your lecture, I think you mentioned that demonstrations started a little later than I remember them starting. Because mm -hmm. I think even in 65, people were starting mm -hmm, to demonstrate mm -hmm. against them. And I, and I never questioned, I mean, I always felt that it was wrong to go into Vietnam. I couldn't understand why we were getting involved in a small country, you know, half the world away that, where I didn't feel like we should belong. But both my and my husband's parents, it took longer to feel that way because they were products of the um, World War II and they thought it was the Great War. And, and, but al also they thought U.S. was powerful and, and if our government made those dis you know, decisions, we should support that. So we had a number of interesting discussions. Um, trying to think what else. I think those are the main things for me. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have a horse snip, so excuse me, I'll be clearing my throat. Um, it's just the way I talk. <clears throat> well, my name is Carol Lewis, and um, it's interesting to listen to your story because mine was really kind of different, and maybe I was kind of a boring type of a person, but I was, in the early 1960s, I was still in high school. And um, I went to, I lived in Pasadena, and I went to an integrated high school, and was friends with lots of people at school, but was not allowed to be friends with them away from school uh, because of those differences, because my parents were I guess what we would call prejudice at, at, at this point. And I always wanted to meet people who were different than I was. And I was kind of raised that my goal in life was to go to college. And that was my father's main goal. It was also very important in my own background that you look good, mm -hmm. and you be attractive, you wear makeup, a nice dress, uh, and so in 1961, I was a princess in the Rose Parade. Oh, wow. Wow. Not <laughs> one of, I said a princess, <laughs> not the princess, <laughs> but from, for Altadena, the float that I was on. And that was a, a defining thing for me because I was kind of shy. And so it um, helped me to get outside of myself a little bit. And, um, Anyway, after I graduated from high school in 1961, I went to um, <coughs> Cal State LA mm -hmm. simply because I couldn't decide what else I wanted to do or I really wanted to go to UCLA, but um, that wasn't going to happen within my family structure. So I was going to a commuter college. And so a lot of <coughs> the social unrest that was going on didn't really hit that because there wasn't the cohesiveness of the students. I then went on to become sweetheart of a fraternity, so you can kind of tell my path that I was going on. And eventually, over some social differences, my parents asked me to leave home. And I still had three years of college to go through, so I got a job at Sears in the credit department for $1.75 an hour. Mm -hmm. And at that, my I found a roommate and we shared an apartment for my rent was $50 a month, and hers was $50 a month, and I save, saved money on that, <laughs> you know, and still supporting myself. And finally, just as I was ready to graduate from college, discovered what I wanted to do, and I ended up um, going into teaching uh, children with visual impairments, so which required me to stay in school for another two years, where my father then unbent a bit and said, I'll help support you because I know you're going to take more time in school. 
he was an optometrist, so what Freudian thing was going on there, I'm not really sure, but anyway, it was the right decision for me, and um, I was very, very lucky uh, that that all turned out that way. But again, my goals were getting myself through school and taking care of myself as opposed to being totally aware of it. I mean, I knew what was going on around me, but I didn't have time to become involved in it. And uh, about 1966, I can't remember the exact year, I became engaged to a veterinarian and he got sent to Vietnam just before um, the Pueblo was seized. That was the next week. World War III was going to break out. And then when he hit Saigon, the Tet Offensive occurred. And I got letters back months and months and months later that I had written to him. And he, when he came back, he said, how'd you get a blue couch? And I said, I wrote you about that. And then <laughs> months after that, uh, the letters came back. And then I understood why I didn't know about the blue couch. But um, it changed him, and it broke us up. And mm -hmm. it altered the course of my life because of not going down that path with him. And started teaching uh, in 1967. And always Vietnam was there. Vietnam was a very big deal. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. uh, being in, I was at college when um, JFK was killed and was in, a, um, in the cafeteria and somebody ran in screaming his head his head and nobody knew what they were talking about and so people started running outside and they had microphones outside uh, that played music and i remember standing in this mob of people while they talked on the radio about what was happening and then they said he's died and everybody just stood there in silence and i didn't know whether to go to class or what to do i went to class and it was excused and um, was home the day um, Martin Luther King was killed. I had the flu, and I remember watching that on TV as it unfolded. And then when RFK was killed, a friend called, and he said, he's been shot in the head, he's killed, he's killed. And I went back to JFK, and I went, I know, I know. No, 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 his brother. And it turns out I went to junior high school with Sirhan Sirhan. But, really? but I didn't know him then. But. Um, Anyway, when I look back in my yearbook and all of that, there, he was a couple of years behind me. And so I kind of went through the 60s in some ways in a bubble because I was having to take care of me. Uh, my parents did not encourage going out and seeking new things and involving yourself. My father was an army colonel, so you know, you did not go against the war, that was for sure. Uh, because it would be unpatriotic. And um, so sometimes now I look back and I go, where the heck was I during all of this time of upheaval? Because I was taking care of me and not taking care of anybody else, it seemed like at that time. It sounds kind of selfish. But um, anyway, and I was passionately in love with Elvis Presley. <laughs> and my uncle was his sound director at Paramount Studios, so I got to meet him and shake his hand and was kissed on the cheek. And we still have two autographed pictures from Elvis Presley in our hallway. <laughs> to Carol, sincerely Elvis Presley. <laughs> so anyway, that, that was a fun thing from that time. But um, that's kind of my story, which is very, very different than, than we yours. We all had different experiences. We all did have mm -hmm. different experiences. So did I. Can I add two more things real quick? Oh, well, she mentions becoming a she mentions becoming a teacher. And when I, I, I remember going to when I was a senior, going to my favorite history professor and saying, gee, I'd like to work in the government or something like that. And this is nineteen sixty four. Well, as a woman, unless you have a PhD, you can be a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary. Mm. And there was sort of no discussion about that in my family as well, even though I, our family was definitely college oriented and everything else. The other thing that it was a whole thing that happened later in the 60s was the whole sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I get together with a group of high school friends every year that we've all reunited. And there's men and women, there's about 25 of us at different times. And one time I was sitting at a table and one of the gals said, okay, 
I want to know what everybody had sex for the first time. And they were all, you know, 65 at that time. <laughs> and we look around because we were all the good kids in high school and everybody was panicked that they would get pregnant. It was before the pill. And the gal that asked the question said when she went away to, when she was leaving at the airport to go away to college, her father said to her, if you get pregnant, don't come home. <clears throat> and I actually had three roommates who all had to get married at Cal or go to Tijuana. When you talk about working, because um, I worked at Sears in those days, um, I worked in the credit department and I took credit applications. And at one point a young man came in to work and he was married, he was younger than I was, and I was told to train him. And he got paid more mm -hmm. as a trainee mm -hmm. than I did as a person who um, had experience because it was figured he was a man, therefore he would have a family to support, right. whereas I was trying to support myself and that didn't count. And, um, mm -hmm. and well, it wasn't pin money, it went toward the rent and the food, yeah, the food which, money. you know, I spent $5 a week on food and $8 if I was gonna have the President of the United States for dinner that night, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, you know, that, that is one thing that stood out of my mind and kind of with Martin Luther King when I was a teacher because I taught handicapped children and when his birthday came around, I would say, we need to celebrate this more than just for black people's freedom. That this made people aware that there were a lot of people that aren't treated well. And I think that Martin Luther King helped women made aware helped other minorities, and I said, it helped you, because visually impaired children were sent away to school before, and, and now they were encouraged to stay at home and in their home schools, and encouraged to be treated as other people, and I said, we owe that to that era, and so when we approach this holiday, that this is something that we need to think about, and I think about this every time uh, Martin Luther King's birth celebration comes up. I'll be quiet. I'm going to pass oh. for now. Here you want. Oh. Sure. Okay. I'll go to Molly. Okay. <laughs> this is very interesting. I feel like I'm in group therapy. <laughs> you know, my mind is just bouncing around with what people are saying. My name is Molly, and Molly White, and what I was thinking about mostly is the difference in my high school years versus college years. I graduated from high school in 65 from college in 1969. And in high school, I was kind of like you. I was into clothes and, you know, looking good and boyfriends and absolutely no social conscience. And by the time I graduated from college, I was entirely different and I think it was because of the time. I mean, I don't know that it was me so much as that's what was, was happening. Um, and you talk about Martin Luther King. I was graduated from San Jose State, and I remember just hearing the news on a Thursday. It was right before Easter break, and driving down to Ventura, where I grew up, in my Volkswagen. And as the day went on, and I could hear on the radio, because we didn't have, of course, CDs or anything <laughs> else, the riots in Detroit and the riots in New Jersey and here and there. And at the beginning of, and it's about a six hour drive, seven hour drive, the way I drove it. And as I got closer to getting home, black people would drive by me and you know shake their fists at me. And I was terrified. Um, and the other thing that I remember so much about the 60s, at, well, the later 60s, because I went to San Jose State, I, this is embarrassing, I became, through my roommate, my roommate and I became very good friends with the guys on the San Jose track team, which included um, Ronnie Way Smith and the, the three, two of the three guys that did the Black Power Salute. Oh, and 68, Tommy Smith and um, Lee Evans. Mm -hmm. and. I, we used to go to parties and they were all friends of mine. And so when I encountered people who were racist and bigoted, I just, 
I just didn't get it. I mean, that's not the way I was raised, but I had not, like you, you had said, how you had friends in high school who were uh, different groups, but you could be friends with them in high school, but your parents didn't kind of approve of that. I remember I kind of had the opposite situation because my parents were pretty liberal, and my dad was so happy because I had a girlfriend whose boyfriend went to Stanford, and he got my dad tickets for a Rose Bowl game. <laughs> you know, so it, it just was never prejudice wasn't something that I was really taught, um, but. I just felt so much that I was part of a really something really important, both with Vietnam and with, with civil rights. And I guess I didn't see too much feminism issues until actually the 70s when I went to law school and um, decided I could do whatever I wanted. If I was able to do it, if I was qualified to do it, if I had the ability to do it, why not? Um, even though I was raised by a very traditional mother. My dad encouraged me so much because he was a lawyer himself, but my mom was much more, you know, get your MRS and mm -hmm. be the woman behind the man and be a great cook and entertainer so he can do well in business. It's like, excuse my French, fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do stuff for me. Um, and I don't know if that's, see, I have a real interesting question because I'm not my grandchildren are under 10, and I don't know too much what the high schoolers and, and 18, excuse me, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, what, what their attitudes are about a lot of things. I feel kind of separated from them, um, just a knowledge of, of what's important to them. But the other comment I'd make, and then I'll, I'll stop, is my freshman year of college, I'll never forget, we had orientation, and they talked about people, I was one of the only people in 1965 in this orientation group whose parents were not divorced, and that just struck me as oh, wow. being so strange. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, in 1965, and in mainly the early 60s. Yeah, this yeah. was in Ventura where I grew up. It's 50s, nobody divorced. And um, then the other thing is they were giving you like where your lockers were or where your you know the health center was or just orientation and this guy stands up and he said they just drafted the whole football team today and you guys are talking about you know lockers and classrooms and so to me the Vietnam War started I became aware of it in 65, 66, and I had a conflict because for a speech class I did a lot of research on getting why we should get out of Vietnam, and my brother was over there. And my mother, who was very liberal, a Johnson Democrat, felt I was being very disloyal to the country, to the president, to my poor brother, and my brother kept sending me letters, which took a while to get to, as you said, keep it up, get me out of here. Um, and I did go down in, I want to say 67 to Oakland to try and stop the uh, the troop ships going out of Oakland for Vietnam, the and the depot there. yeah, and it was. We also had marches against Dow Chemical at San Jose State, mm -hmm. and I never, but I never had to get a bail bondsman. I never had that problem. <laughs> so that's kind of and the, the thing I, I loved about your class is it. Ju I mean. It just brought me back. I mean, really, the emotions, what was going on, and how well I could remember all that stuff, even though it was 40, 50 years ago. And I really, I really thought it was a, a very interesting experience and a very, I'm so happy you're looking into it. I enjoyed it a lot. Okay, next. Hi, my name is Lonnie Horn, and um, I graduated from high school in 63 and college in 67, so it covered part high school, all of college, and then my early career days. Um, I, I grew up moving around the country, and it, during the 60s, we were living in, my family was living in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. so it's really a different experience. Yeah. Most of you are Californians. Yeah. Um, so I went to a very small high school of 600 students. And then I went to Tufts University in Boston, which is, at the time, about 3,200 undergraduates. So that's a pretty small school mm -hmm. as well. But Boston is basically a college town yeah. because there's MIT and Harvard and Northeastern and BU and, you know, yeah. like 60 or 70 colleges. Um, so, but it was st in the 60s. Well, when we moved to Rhode Island, um, 
it was my junior year in high school, and we had been living in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. where the girls have big hair and lots of makeup, and 12-year-olds wear high heels, and I mean, Gosh. you are, when we moved there, when I was coming from this country town in Illinois, I was the hick from the sticks. <laughs> it was awful. So, but then I got it with the program, you know? So I showed up for the first day of high school in Rhode Island in my junior year, and everybody thought I was a new teacher. Because I, because <laughs> I was, I had on a shirt waist dress and high heels, and my hair was all done, and I had on makeup. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so then I got into the, you know, the knee socks and the kilts with the kilt pin and the round collar sweaters and all that. But it was still very, very conservative. And even when I went to college, it was, Boston was not a hotbed of real. Um, activity, probably more so at some of the bigger schools in downtown Boston where they had more stuff going on, but a small school kind of in the suburbs. Um, we were about 10 minutes from Harvard by the MTA and maybe 20 minutes from MIT. Um, there wasn't a lot of activism going on in those days. In fact, we barely knew what was going on in those days. It just wasn't <laughs> something, you know, pot, what's that? Um, it was just very, very different. Then, when I graduated from college, I um, went to, I was a math major in college, and so I went to work for IBM in Washington, D.C. Well, let me tell you, 67 to 70 in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., I was there for all that yeah. stuff, um, and it was very interesting. But, once again, I was in the conservative side of the world because I was working for IBM as a systems engineer and um, all my customers were government customers and including the um, you know, the Federal Reserve Board that was in the Watergate building and the, the door that they went in and out of you know that they I used to use that door to get from the parking garage <laughs> to the building um, so um, of course, everything was happening, and I had the, the, the day of Martin Luther King's death. I was in um, Washington, D.C. at one of my customers, I don't remember which one, and um, I was driving out to my branch office, and the, the news was already on, but of course I'd been in office building and didn't hear it. And I was driving out from downtown out to the suburbs of Maryland um, through a not very nice part of Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden the storefronts blew out of two oh stores on, and the riots were starting. Yeah. And um, I immediately rolled up my windows and locked my doors because then was, the storefronts windows blew out and people came running from the side streets. They were carrying televisions and arms full of stuff. And mm -hmm. so I figured, oh, this isn't good. And there was a, <laughs> and, a good <laughs> and I was concerned because in front of me, and it was uh, one of the big state streets that radiate out like spokes yeah. on a wheel in Washington. So the traffic was moving slowly with all these stoplights, and there was a, a white girl on a motor scooter in front of me. And this neighborhood was all black, and I thought, oh, she's really not in a good position. So she was okay. I followed her, followed her out, um, and we made it. Well, that night it took me two and a half hours to drive from my office in um, Silver Spring, Maryland to my apartment in McLean, Virginia, a drive which normally would take half an hour. It was two and a half hours because everybody was so panicked. People were evacuating. They were leaving the city. They were trying to get other places and nobody knew what was going on and it was terrible. So then everything was closed the next day. And um, my sister and a roommate were coming up from William and Mary to spend the weekend, and I was going to take them to see the National Monuments. Well, no. Um, drive up to the Lincoln Memorial and see it ringed completely by National Guardsmen with their feet, you know, like in their guns, and their feet were foot to foot to foot all the way around the, the I mean, it was, we don't see stuff like that in this country. So that was really, really scary. And I just looked at my sister and her roommate and I said, I think we're going down to Mount Vernon today because, <laughs> because there was no moving around the city at all. And once I got to back to work, we had to prove residency to cross the Key Bridge to get out to Virginia. And so it was really um, a hassle. But, and it, as I'm working for conservative IBM, 
where the men had to wear white shirts and sincere ties. Um, sincere ties. I sincere like ties, yes. <laughs> um, my husband was getting his PhD as um, a Navy program where he would, they would pay for him to get his PhD and then he had to serve um, active duty. So we were kind of the military industrial complex mm -hmm. at that time. And um, that was, which was kind of interesting. Um, he was arrested one night when he was coming to pick me up because he was a suspicious character. I don't know why he was a suspicious character. Short hair, you know, but anyway. That was um, suspicious. <laughs> that was <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so, um, but uh, one other thing I forgot to, when I was in college, I was editor of my yearbook, my senior year. And that was when SDS was really getting started. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many people came to me right before the deadline for the yearbook to say, please take SDS out of my listings for activities. Mm -hmm. You know, by your pictures. Because, the, and you know, one guy even said, you know, I might want to go into politics and that's probably not be a, a good thing. Oh, so wow. these, yeah, because it was, it, it was pretty controversial yeah. at that time. I mean, at least in Boston it was. It was, I mean, you were really out there if you were participating in that. Um, so uh, we did, we honored their request to take it out and it's, I wonder what has become of those people if that was a good move on their part or not. But um, I eventually left Washington and um, the one of the things that really s struck me about that whole period of time was I wasn't involved in the feminist movement, and I think I always told people that my dad forgot to tell me I was a girl, you know. And I didn't, I didn't have preconceived notions of barriers in jobs. And by luck, the job that I got out of college was a job that was a brand new kind of job that had didn't have a stereotype of whether a man or a woman would do it. It wasn't like nursing or teaching or something like that. This was a relatively new thing in te the technology field. But um, I did find out that when IBM hired us and put us through training, that the men in the cl training class got $20 a month more than the women did, mm -hmm. even with the same degree. Mm -hmm. So those things were going on, but I kind of, so it was interesting. It's interesting, <coughs> the, the people I meet every year, we, we went away for a whole weekend with a bunch of women a year, year ago, and <coughs> There's a couple, I mean, we were all achievers, but most people came, became housewives or, or went into teaching, nursing, or one of those. And there are three gals of maybe 15 women. Two have got their PhDs and the other one has a law degree. And they've, on their career paths, have gone a little further. All of them said they had fathers who really believed in them. Mm -hmm. Talk about your father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not that my, our fathers didn't believe in us, but there was more... We should be the it traditional was, path of our mothers. Right, and my dad was never that way. It was never, if you go to college, it's when you go to college. Um, any sport that my sister and I wanted to take up or do, we were allowed to do. We weren't told, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, I was captain of my basketball team when they didn't play basketball, and girls played half-court basketball because we couldn't run the full court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that was, mm -hmm. that's really a key to it. Yeah, it was very interesting to hear that. So. Sally? Are you, you have to say I'm not like prepared. <laughs> Nobody, Nobody is. You sound like you No, I had wanted to uh, sign up for this class, but uh, somehow didn't manage to do it. And then I was uh, checking my email today, and I saw, oh, there it goes. <laughs> There's an, a session today. So I said, well, I'll drop in and see what it's about. Um, okay, talk. Uh, the one thing about the 1960s I can say is my experience is different. Uh, back in 19, up until June 1965, I was in Taiwan. And then I came uh, to the States, and uh, after about a month, I ended up in New York. So most of my experience in the 60s was back in New York. Um, I was, I found a job because I couldn't work without the right visa. 
So I had to go and work for the United Nations because they had a special dispensation <laughs> on the visa deal. And then I signed up for night classes at Hunter College, which is now part of the City University of New York. And um, I was uh, attending night school, but the 60s, because of the student movements, I, I was there when they started to use tear bombs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also my graduation had to be curtailed. Uh, it wasn't a formal affair because they were still throwing t tear bombs. So, and then uh, towards the end of the 60s, I made a trip to Paris to sort of brush up on my French. And that was when, uh, this was run by the, um, by the university and because of the student movements there, we couldn't go into the campuses mm. and the classes were held on high school campuses instead. And it's, it's uh, also uh, one other experience that I did remember when I was going to college was uh, we had an argument in class and some students were complaining about all the losses that you, the U.S. was suffering in Vietnam and how many people were getting killed. And I made the stupid remark, you know, there were so many um, Americans being killed, but did you ever think about how many Vietnamese were being killed? And the teacher turned around and told me, you'll never get very far in this country. <laughs> well, they've been fighting in the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this was, I was, nobody was arguing with me until then. <laughs> I think that's about all I need to say. Well, I'm Barry Ackerman, and I'm the lone male in this group. <laughs> I grew up uh, in the Midwest, in Milwaukee, a suburb of Milwaukee, actually. And um, I graduated high school in 1960. Um, so there was a transition going on between my high school days in the 50s and when I graduated in June of 1960. Um, and the Midwest, as you probably know, is known for its conservatism. and um, I was no exception. I was probably the most naive 17, 18 year old who graduated high school that you can imagine. I look like those characters in the movies, you know. And I was going to, um, I, I was a good athlete in high school and I was a runner and I got an invitation, a letter came from Brown University to go to Rhode Island and I, so I made a, a trip to Providence and to see what that was all about. And the coach was very nice and he showed me all around and he said, uh, and these are your teammates who'll be the people who'll be your teammates. And they were all from well-to-do families on the East Coast. And they were very nice to me. And then I said, well, what do you do? You know, uh, is there a football weekend, something? Oh, we don't care about that. We go into New York and you only need a few hundred dollars in your pocket every weekend. And I thought, a few hundred dollars? I don't think I've ever seen that much in my lifetime. <laughs> So I kind of turned down Brown, even though they were going to give me a partial scholarship. And I went to school in Madison mm -hmm. to probably the most unique major college campus in the United States at that time in the 60s, because they were already the, in the forefront of protests and change and you know everything was going on. There was football weekends and there were student protests and there were soapboxes right on campus, people voicing their opinion about everything. And um, I, again, I kind of floated my way through the first couple of years on campus. I started in the dorms, <clears throat> where I met all, people from all over the United States and outside the United States. And then I met up with some guys, and we wanted to do um, a roommate situation and rent a place. So we rented a, a room above the sporting goods on State Street, which is the place, the happening place in Madison. And uh, there we were perched among, above everything that was going to go on. <laughs> all the riots, all the drinking, all the carousing, everything that happened was right at our doorstep. And uh, 
it was an interesting experience because I had grown up very conservative, sheltered life in a very conservative kind of community, and suddenly I was just going hog wild. I mean, you know, I, I think I drank and slept through a number of weekends. Um, I was engaged in sports at the university, and I walked on to the track team, and after the first year, the coach decided he better give me a scholarship because he might lose me to somebody else. So um, I got my college education paid for for three years fully on a track scholarship. And I knew the people from San Jose. Um, even though they were high schoolers at the time, I was uh, yeah. competing. And by 64, when I tried out for the Olympics, um, they were already starting to make their names known around the United States. Um, but I remember most at being at Wisconsin um, that day when JFK was shot, and I was walking up mm -hmm. the hill towards the administration building when people came running down screaming the news. And I think I was in shock because it didn't occur to me that anything like that could even happen yeah. Yeah. in the United States. It was beyond yeah. me too. credible Absolutely. belief. I could not, it, I couldn't grasp it. And I just turned around even though I was going to class, and I just kind of, I was in a um, shock, there, actually in shock, in a fog. And I went down to the drugstore that everybody went to, and everybody was talking about it. And it was just a jumble in my mind about it. And then we went and we watched on TV and what the coverage was. And um, I think for days and maybe even weeks afterwards, uh, nothing sunk in other than that event. Mm -hmm. Nothing was made any sense. Because JFK was kind of a hero to all the young people in the United States, uh, right or wrong, you know whether he would have made us a better country or not is is always going to be up for debate. But that was one instance that really shook me up. <clears throat> and then, just when I was graduating, was all the the radical people who were blowing up buildings and protesting and doing things that again. We didn't think people were ever going to do those things. We never thought we would see those kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, but I was in transition. I graduated in 64. Um, and I, I'd come out here for the Rose Bowl on January 1st in 63, when Wisconsin played in the Rose Bowl. And of course, we couldn't believe it. There was no snow on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> people were in the swimming pools drinking beer. I mean, it was quite a different uh, society out here. And the girls didn't wear bobby socks <laughs> and, and, and poodle skirts. They were not dressed like that at all. Um, and in fact, I met my wife out here when I came out a year later in, for graduate school. I had actually been offered a chance to do a doctorate program at UW in Madison. Um, and I started into it, and the phone rang at the end of the very first week, and it was the secretary uh, from the medical school at UCLA, and she said, how would you like to come out here and do a doctorate in immunogenetics at UCLA? And I didn't even know what she was talking about. <laughs> you know, I, that was kind of a foreign term to me. And I said, sure, because I'd been out for the Rose Bowl, and I, it was going to be cold that winter in Wisconsin again. <laughs> so I, I threw everything in my car, and I drove out to Southern California and I got, she handed me some papers and I signed them very quickly and I was assigned to, to be an assistant uh, professor, assistant to a professor in basic sciences, you know, biology and genetics and things like that. And then I, I had a major professor assigned to me for my doctorate and it turned out later, I mean, he was, he was on fast tracking me. I got my doctorate in two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. But then I found out afterwards, about three years afterwards, um, he was thrown out of UCLA for plagiarizing. <laughs> so I think he fudged a few things on my, my doctorate, but uh, I just breezed through it. I didn't, again, I didn't even, I was kind of like very naive about all these things, and I just took the paper and ran. And, um, and Ronald Reagan was elected uh, governor of California in 60, November 64. And by January 65, he declared that anybody that wasn't already a full resident, you know, you either had to leave or I wasn't going to pay for you anymore. So he pulled the budget from everyone. And um, my, I had met my wife here in, at a swimming pool in Brentwood. <laughs> and I thought nice. she was like 21 or so, and I was 23. And no, she was 17. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, so we, against your parents' wishes, we got married. And, and of course, they said it won't last six months. And I think we're headed for 48 years now. But um, it, it was uh, changed my life again. I had to go work. So I accepted a job in the biologic industry. And I'm trying to think now, it equated to about a little over $10,500 a year. That was a big salary. That was huh? a big salary. I started out at 4500 a year. Yeah, well, I was amazed I that too. they were going to pay me that <laughs> much. He was a man, over, that's right. Could you never get over $500 a month. Well, but then I found out that people, people in that same area of research where I was working were making twice as much. And they'd only been there like a couple of years. And I thought, well, that's not fair. So I stayed with, uh, this was the Baxter Highland Division in Glendale. I stayed there five years. And I eventually was discovered that I knew how to write. I had written for the, the Daily Cardinal at the University of Wisconsin, mostly doing sports reporting. And then I became editor of the sports section. But the editor in chief was a guy you may remember on TV named Jeff Greenfield. And he did a lot of political reporting. And Jeff made quite a name for himself. And he just ripped me up one side and down the other. He told me I couldn't write for you know what. But, um, uh, it was a great experience. And I met him many, many years later when I had my company and I was in business. And he was on a program. He was the keynote speaker. And uh, he didn't remember me, of course. But, um, but I met him. And I was very impressed at how well he had done. And he, had, he was another person who changed the climate of the way people thought well, who were students at a major university. Mm -hmm. He dared to come out and be outspoken. He just didn't parrot back what they wanted him to. And uh, I guess that's why he made a great name for himself. Barry, yeah. did you have any, you didn't have any issues with the draft because you were I had no interest, uh, no issues with the draft because I was in a graduate right. program. Right. There was that the exemption. The that student. was kind of a problem. Those that were going to school didn't have to worry about the draft. And yes, they did eventually, though, because I had one they roommate did. who got well, married well, because I mean, of they were allowed to get through school. I had a friend that made the, um, the cover of Time magazine, and they wrote up an article about him because he was in school, and therefore he was avoiding the draft, at least until he got out of school. But, you know, like my friend Ray, you know, they let him stay in school until he graduated. And then they brought him over to Vietnam. And they said, what the heck are we going to do with you? We don't need another veterinarian. Mm. And, um, you know, of course, then my whole life was watching body counts. You know, yeah. every single day, you know, yeah. worrying myself to death that he or his friend, right. or other friend John was going to be killed. And if I had been going to school a couple of years later during that mid-60s era, I'm sure the Vietnam War and everything that happened with that would have much more impacted me. But I was kind of always like one either back. one step back or one step ahead of yes, what was I think going on. I 68 or 69 that my husband was in graduate school and he got a letter from his draft board that said, next time you're in town, we'd like to see you when we think you're smart enough. So he complied and he went. Um, and he had done a practicum with the um, Bethesda Naval Hospital, because um, it's a clinical psychologist. So he had done a practicum. And they tried to get him to go on this program originally. And he wasn't interested, because he thought he was immune from the draft. Mm -hmm. And then when his draft board said that, so he went back to the Navy and said, you know that program you were telling me about? I think I'm interested. Yeah. So they got him on. His commission into the Navy came the day before his draft notice. Oh, wow. wow. So he would have gone. That was a huge, that's a huge thing, though, for I, the, I had the later 60s, because yeah. I know people who, well, like, I have a cousin who, his parents found a psychiatrist that said he wasn't going to make it. I mean, not that he would have, I mean, he would have, but they, he wanted to get out of it. Somebody else I know slept on their mother-in-law's carpet because they were allergic to the carpet the night before the physical and so, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I, I find myself to this day, for some odd reason, kind of avoiding the Vietnam War and thinking about it because it impacted my life so strongly. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm very interested in World War II because my parents met during World War II and I'm a product of World War II and I love taking classes on World War II. And yet I ended up teaching in Little Saigon. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, 
had wonderful students and met wonderful people, parents and everything, and the stories that those people went through, you know, after after the war and stuff. But I have kind of an avoidance of hearing about the Vietnam War and thinking about the Vietnam War because it had such a bad impact personally on my life. It was, but every night on the news. Oh, it was. Right at dinner time, it was, it was I mean, overwhelming. I knew every trail. But, but you know, I knew every I wasn't city. I worried and worried and worried. Um, I, just because I was cloistered and I was a teacher and I had to abide by the rules of being a teacher and what they called the morals clause, yeah, <laughs> which I found out later was a joke. Uh, <laughs> there really wasn't one, but um, yeah, for those years, I was just so worried, as I'm, as my mother was when my father was in World War II, you know, and she carried prejudices and concerns for a lot of time in her adult life afterwards, whereas I just kind of take that Vietnam War and kind of was so bad mm -hmm. and impacted my life so negatively that um, I don't like to think about it. Yeah. Well, what do you think that we have forgotten about that period, especially with Vietnam, and um, and do you in, do you do you think that there's been a collective desire to forget because it was such a traumatic moment? And do you but do you see the trauma kind of bubbling up in other places because it is so different than World War II in terms of? I, I think that, I think there was a lot of forgetting because yeah. I think a lot of us feel incredible guilt against the people who were serving there. Because, I mean, I demonstrated against people, and, and, and people looked down on service people, but here they had been drafted. I mean, it wasn't like that they were volunteering like our Army today a little bit more. Um, and I think people after it were really shaken by it. You know, I well, I didn't, I didn't demonstrate specifically yeah. because I had somebody there. Well, and no, of course you would. And for me, it felt like it would be disloyal that I was... Um, right. Of course you know, um, going against him, and so I kind of kept my mouth shut. And also, too, I was a product of an army family, and my father was a colonel, and so I had that indoctrination and, you know, patriotism and this kind of thing. Plus, I was trying to survive on my own, and so you don't hear people talk about it a lot mm -hmm. now, but I was certainly impacted by what the after effect of it because I taught in Garden Grove yeah. and that was very heavily impacted by uh, the refugees that came over and at first when we got students that came they were the children of um, the elite you know yeah. well give me 40 Vietnamese kids you know turn this off uh, <laughs> you know you know because they were just great you know and of course I know most of the kids are you know to this day, but it was like a child here, a child there, a child here, and then all of a sudden it became, we were we taught cultural ramifications of Vietnam and language and how to approach things and stuff like that, and it really, really impacted where I worked, you well, know. There's also the whole thing, and this is of course the 70s, but I had just had my second child and it was the fall of Vietnam. Yeah. And I remember every single night watching the news, like a 10 o'clock news, and dreaming about it every night. Because the fall was a whole other thing that was like, oh my God, it's happening? That's for another course. Yeah, yeah. 70s. Yeah. <laughs> I, the event that kind of worried me more than anything was the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. And oh, so yeah. many people were just like, um, Nervous about sure. the whole situation, what was that? Um, was and I don't think we understood. Yeah. We didn't understand all of the ramifications fully, right. but we knew that there's something terrible might happen. Right. And, and um, well, I had yeah. family friends had built bomb shelters. Yeah. And my mother mm -hmm. was like, um, "Yeah, we're going to go in the bomb shelter, and our <laughs> neighbors are going to knock on the door, and we're going to say no." Right. How can we do that? And if we do, they're going to put it. I remember her saying they're going to put a tin can over it and block the air. And so it was just like, if we go, we go. But I remember my mom showing a closet that was this wide and this wide. And they, she'd taken all the, the linen and stuff out of it. And if worse came to worse, that's where we were going to live until all this was over. I was, the linen closet. What? I was 12, <laughs> I guess, or 13. That was in the 50s. And I was... The bomb. Well, anybody the bomb. building a bomb shelter? Well, I'm talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, okay. Yeah, that I was just... 
you know, I was terrified, and I love to go back and look at that history because to me, there was so much going on that it, maybe we knew about it then and I just wasn't paying attention, but um, there was that fear. And then we also had the fear in the 50s of the drop drills and, you right. know, here's right. Russia's And gonna the bright and light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. So, and that was your 50s class, which right. I thought was very interesting as yeah. well. But I remember I'm looking at that closet and then. thinking. Yeah. But we were all products of the 50s going into the yeah, 60s, right. so we had that. This might be um, a strange question, but since you're here and willing to talk, I'm going to ask you, um, <laughs> which is, um, how did you think about communism in the 1960s, and did your thoughts on it evolve from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the failures in Vietnam? Like, I, w we, we often think about communism in terms of foreign policy or um, uh, how presidents are navigating it and using it as a way to... Um, you know, deploy people to places like Vietnam, but I've never really understood what it felt like, especially in the 1960s, because in the 50s, it, it makes sense to me that communism was this unabashed evil that was terrifying, but the 60s were such a different decade, and I've never really had a sense of how people really felt about communism and communist nations, especially since so many uh, Americans members... Americans never, never understood, nor did they know what communism was. Right. Yeah. Is that, is it, and well, we were, we were, well, except though, yeah. we were afraid of it, and right. afraid of, I think, of them have to go, taking over us the way, I think, in the 40s, people were afraid about Germany right. and Japan, and so this was the new enemy type of thing, so it was very, very, very bad, and, you know, when you talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I had a boyfriend, because I was into that kind of stuff, uh, who worked at a grocery store, and he called me, and I could hear all of this noise in the background, and he said, people are stripping the shelves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People were stripping the shelves during the um, crisis, because sure. they thought that there was going to be no food. And a couple of years ago, I took a cruise, and we went to Leningrad, or St. Petersburg, and um, I remember we got off the boat and we were on the um, uh, on the bus going on our tour, which was run by a, a Russian company. And my cousin and I were going, I can't believe we're here because this was the enemy all right. our right. lives. We couldn't believe it was here. And they they did have a different way of kind of approaching us and finding the guide who knew every single fact about St. Petersburg that ever has been written. Um, she said, we are rewriting our history now, because what we were told during those times, mm -hmm. we have now found out wasn't necessarily so, and so we're having to relearn, and there's a very strong uh, religious component there that must have been driven out of yeah, underground right, during right. that time. Yeah. And, um, but I just remember it was always the great evil, and you had to fight against it. Just like right now, we're fighting against Al Qaeda and terrorism and stuff like that. This is now our it was great, never as powerful as that. Great, never. our great evil. Well, you know, that but we I think we were afraid of it as if it were that because we didn't know what it was. Well, it was never really. You never really saw it. You but we were really told it was bad. In 1961, I had, I'm a little older than most of you, but I had just graduated from college in the Bay Area and um, went to Russia on a trip. Well, I was just in a, uh, staying in hostels and that kind of thing. But we did go on a, on a trip through a lot, a lot of Russia uh, during that period, and I say one of the things that was unique about it was that it was English speaking, which meant we had a lot of British people, mm -hmm. and these British people happened to be uh, have a communist uh, bent. And um, anyway, we went through Russia, and it was the thing we all remarked about was that it was pictured, you know, as such an enemy and. Um, and yet the buildings were falling apart, and uh, it was amazing mm -hmm. the the lack of of ordinary things they had, and the stores had very little in them. Although one time we were out in a commune, and uh, Titov had just gone off in space, mm -hmm. and the uh, Russians out on this commune were so uh, excited. And they had a kind of an assembly room there, and 
out in this farm and they all came in and just grinned at us and uh, you know it was amazing to see all this here they'd done something remarkable in a country that was just to our eyes falling apart and every hotel room was bugged oh that was oh and they watched you and we had the name like of a know. Baptist church uh, in Moscow that my friend had been given somewhere along the line. There were no maps given out. We would ask, where is this church? We had an address, we had everything. Uh, there was no help from the hotel at all. And finally we went out on the street and uh, passerbys just helped us out and uh, took us by subway over to this church, and, and the church was packed. Uh, elderly people, mainly, but we were up, they made a point of giving us a seat up in the balcony. And then after the service, uh, they came, the elders came and got us and took us back to uh, one of their meeting rooms, and we met with the um, ministers, the Baptist ministers, and some of their officials, and uh, they told us how bad things were, and asked us to have our religious leaders, the, our personal, to write to them, and they really wanted to hear about what it was like in the United States. And then the nicest thing, they got us a car. They actually had a car. And that was very unusual. There wasn't a lot of traffic. They took us back to the hotel. And uh, we were checked in by the hotel. I don't know if they knew where we went, but. They knew where you were. They probably knew where we were because, oh boy, they chased us. There was no well, I remember being so against the Vietnam War and but I can still see it, the, the dominoes, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like, who cares? I mean, so what? First of all, I didn't know if I believed it, but even if this country and then that country, it's their country. Mm -hmm. Let them do what they want. Just because we're not going to get them to go our way, so leave, why are we killing all our young men, mm -hmm. you know, right. and, and maiming them and that, to protect us from this domino that who cares? And it. It was like in the 50s when I was younger, I remember seeing something on television, and it couldn't have been in color because we didn't have color television then, but it was just this big blob of Russia was yeah. taking over the, mm -hmm. the um, uh, Eastern Europe and this and that and next, and then here comes Cuba, and I was concerned about that, but that was 63. But by the time Vietnam was heating up in 67, 68, I just didn't believe it anymore. And it, it, it didn't... I. Yeah, it might happen, but oh well. I didn't see how we could, it wasn't worth the battle right. in my mind. How would we have loved, liked it if during the Civil Rights Movement we'd had people from Great Britain or, or France come over here with military and say, now we're going to straighten everybody here out. Oh, yeah. We would have welcomed them, right? Yeah. Just yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, I, I'm always amazed that we think we can impose our we know will, we know better, on another culture. Well, I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back to the night to 1960. Take you to a time just when JFK was elected president. His inauguration speech was in January of 1961. Uh, my husband and I were living in um, a rented townhouse in uh, a little town in Maryland. The day of the inauguration was freezing cold. Mm -hmm. Things stopped, things didn't move, everything was iced over. Kind of like Atlanta last night. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much like it. Probably not quite as cold as that, though. And I remember my husband had been in New York on a business trip, and it took him forever to get back on the train because they didn't, because the air service was not that terrific. Mm -hmm. And so, there were no planes flying. Anyway, he, when he got home, the first thing we did was we were going to watch the inauguration on television because we weren't invited. <laughs> and that was an emotional moment, but a tremendously emotional moment that was not just for us, but it echoed for 
everybody we knew, everybody in that same age range, mm -hmm. that everybody who had come through as children maybe who were the first of, in their family who had finished college, uh, who had great plans for the future, but what we were imbued with was this tremendous feeling of we can do anything yep. and we're going to change this country. Two years later, we had bought our first house and it was in an urban renewal area in Washington, D.C. called Southwest Washington, mm -hmm. which is not far actually from the T Potomac River, mm -hmm. the waterfront, the mm -hmm. famous waterfront. But it was also built right in front of some horrific slum areas. Some of that had been corrected, but there were still, this entire area was still full of um, people who really needed to be helped, and the urban renewal area wasn't helping them. The, it, was supposed to, it was supposed to give them a boost up to see where they could go and what they could do, and they were hoping that in this urban renewal area, all us white folks who were moving into these lovely places would be able to change the school system, to change the tax base, to do all sorts of things for them. It was a very strange conceit. And I did bring a picture because the house, the first house, was an unusual house. It was made out of aluminum. <laughs> and it was called River Park. I'm going to pass this around. And we lived, it was a four story house. And uh, there were other houses that were without the aluminum front, and there was also a high rise building. The high rise building was our stone wall against the far side of town. Our swimming pool actually was kind of in the middle. And if you were from the other side of town, you could come by and you could look in through the gates and see our swimming pool which really was not a very good feeling if you really wanted to build bridges between the haves and the have-nots. <laughs> the schools were also quite a mess. But I do remember that the strongest feeling at the time was this feeling of, we can do it. And there were scads of people in our generation who moved in, who bought those houses, who were employed by the new Kennedy administration, and. Uh, had the same kind of feeling about that. It was an incredible time. We, we kind of, we lived in, we knew everybody who was writing columns, we knew everybody who was on television, on radio, the Voice of America was right down the block. We, it, was, it was a very heady kind of an experience. But when um, the assassination happened, you could feel it yep. in the air. Like the air just went out of a balloon. Things changed, totally, completely Overnight. changed. When um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and we had riots, as Lonnie described. We had terrible riots. I used to pack my um, middle daughter's lunch because she would get on a bus to go over the Key Bridge to go to school in Virginia. I used to pack it with wet washcloths in plastic bags because we knew that there was tear gas the, at the slightest drop of a hat. And we used to instruct her, okay, if you get into that, take that wet washcloth, put it on your face. She was five years old. It was kind of weird. And wasn't it weird seeing the National Guard surrounding the, National the monuments? Guard? I mean, it's something that you see in Egypt, you know, you don't see it. Here, well, we didn't even have a frame of reference. I mean, it was, it was, uh, do you, was do you think crazy. that that time when JFK was elected and all the possibilities is kind of, and I may be all wrong, but reflected like when Ob uh, Obama was elected, again, there was this new... Not the same feeling, not, not the, the same, same intensity. Of, of, a new hope, no. you know. Well, um, I, I, think think it, I think it depends on the community. I was teaching right. in Newark, New Jersey, when Obama was inaugurated, and I watched the inauguration on my campus uh, with my students, and which I think was probably quite different than if I had been at UC Irvine and watching yeah. it with my students there. You know, so Newark is a largely African American city, 
and um, it was remarkably emotional uh, to to see that. And so I think that um, so there there was I and and maybe much like Kennedy, the hope for Obama I think was less what he represented in terms of his policies. But for me, at least, when I saw Michelle Obama come in and understood that there was an African American family in the White House, like that optic was so um, devastating for me emotionally, you know, because I teach on civil rights and just thinking about like the first family is this beautiful African American family. I mean, that seems so hopeful um, in a country that's been so damaged by the history of racial prejudice. Well, I will, yeah. I would agree with you yeah. with that. I, and I, I understand that feeling. Yeah. But it was still a different, different tenor. Well, he was it, the youngest president we'd ever had by a long shot, wasn't he? Well, we related to him. Right. Right, and comparing we, him to Eisenhower, who was right. like our grandfather, right. to right. have this young, dashing family, and then this grandpa, and it was just the age. I well, remember... We, also, we related to his words, which yes. weren't always his, but, right. but still we related to that, and right. you can never discount the power of a word. Oh, yeah. The that torch is passed to the generation born in this century. I mean, that was us. That wasn't that's, our that's grandparents. Right. That was us. Right. It was, um, it was a very heady time, and I knew a lot of people who got their heads bashed in in the riots in Chicago. Um, that was, by then, it was not a matter of bail bondsmen, but it was a matter of they need a good lawyer. <laughs> and it was... <coughs> That was a very strange kind of experience. <clears throat> but I wouldn't have given that experience of living in Washington, D.C. and raising three children in that whole time period for anything, because it was an incredible. Well, you must have been frightened by the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Too. We were, but not that much, because we were young and stupid, and we just felt Oh, we'll get out of this. Nothing's going to happen to us. Oh, I remember being frightened living in yeah. New York, but um, my parents were out here in California, and they didn't seem to have any concern. It was the East Coast, and I remember that they would draw circles mm -hmm. and, and yeah. include... 200 miles, 300 miles, yeah, how far yes. they were. Yeah, yeah. People so were no. concerned out here. Uh, no, well, they weren't within they, those circles. I know, but even still, I mean, there was the threat of war. You know, yeah. that, you know, there's always that kind of, okay, you do this, <laughs> I'm going to get you back, you know, and well, I'll get you back better. And so there was, there was a fear that if they, if we shot at them, they might retaliate, therefore we have to retaliate bigger. And so therefore, it could be the end of the world. By, even though we were out here in California, we weren't going to get the first hit but we might get the second. And I remember, what was that name of that movie? Um, took place in Australia. On the beach. On the, be on the on beach. beach. Yeah. Fred Astaire. I was terrified I when I saw that movie. And to this day, I don't like to see movies that portray the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Because that You're was You're gonna so, see more and more of it. Though. That was so, <laughs> well, I avoid them. I, you know, um, it was so realistic to me of what could happen mm -hmm in that radiation cloud moving and people getting ready to die and everything like that, that it was terrifying. And so here in California, we may not have taken that first hit, but we were afraid we might take the third or the fourth hit. Because um, once it starts, you know, I hit you, you hit me back, I'll hit you a little harder, you know, and um, so we thought the, the end of the world was possibly upon us. We. I, I'm speaking only for you know my generation. I think older people than we um, had more fear about what might happen, but we still had this great faith in the leader in the White House and his group that would you know outsmart and outdo the Russians, and we wouldn't you know we came to the brink, but that we would never cross over it. Now, as I say, we. We were a very young and we were an arrogant lot, and we just figured, you know, we were Teflon, yeah. and nothing could 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 hurt us. It also was what seven days. I mean, it, it yeah, blew it was, up. It's exactly. Oh my right. God! And then it was somehow it was being resolved, and then it, phew, you look back on it and say that was close, but we're yeah. all okay. We, uh, we would say we knew that would be okay, which was very. I stupid, didn't feel but, like that. But I didn't feel I, like that either. And there was a lot of uncertainty among a lot of people. 
I was frightened during that time. Well, I had just, <coughs> I had lived in Paris and had a kind of a ridiculous job, <laughs> but it was during the um, Algerian War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working for the New York Herald Tribune, and we, they needed an English-speaking person to um, try to catch the Russian correspondent, their Russian correspondent, in case the Russians uh, interrupted the, uh, the telephone conversation, because he'd call. That was better than italics at that time. You could follow it better. Anyway, uh, they, the Algerians were bombing uh, newspapers. And so I remember the Figaro had been bombed, and we were kind of concerned. We worked generally from about 6 p.m. till 12. And um, we were on the second floor, and the basement had the printers, and the first floor was an office. People could go in and, and if they, during the day, if they wanted to make an uh, ad in the paper or something like that, they were on the first floor. Well, at 11.30 one night, they blew up the office. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, nobody was hurt because we hadn't left work and we were on the second floor. But uh, it was frightening, I tell you, fri very frightening to me being right there. But the funny part was that Art Buckwall, if those of you of an age might remember Art Buckwall, he worked there. And uh, he would come in every night and they had placed a bomb in some of the newspapers in a Coke machine. So he'd come in and he'd look in the co in our Coke <laughs> machine, see if there was a bomb in there. And then, <laughs> and then see shut it. it and we would go on. He was a on. great jokester. <laughs> oh yeah. And then they finally moved him up on the third floor away from anyone because he was such a, uh, you know, he, you could, he interrupted you with Right. <laughs> Jokes, yeah. It was funny. But, uh, yeah, that was an experience. And I remember that. That was what year? It was about 62, something like that. How would you compare your students in the last several years as far as their political activity, political involvement, their sense of I, mean, I just have the feeling that people from our generation, at least the people in Ollie, were pretty much involved or in the 60s politically. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it's, um, I'm not going to answer your question with a question, okay. <laughs> though I'm tempted to because um, one of the things that I'm curious about is what happens to the optimism that Jesse is just defining because to participate in activism or protest presupposes that you think you can change things, right? There's a sense of we can affect the structures of government, we can affect uh, the conditions of our own education, we can affect the intimate details of our lives, and it strikes me that you were a generation that actually believed that, you know, that you had this faith that if people got together, educated themselves, and made visible the problems that they experienced, they could help solve those problems. And I don't think my students have that sense of optimism. No. Um, so I, so I, you know, I, I hesitate to characterize them as apathetic or selfish or narcissistic. Um, I think they were, they're growing up and coming of age in very difficult economic circumstances. Absolutely. And so anxieties over um, their futures in terms of being able to get jobs is very live for them. But I think there's also this existential state that they um, exist under that I don't think you did, which is I think they're remarkably cynical about just how entrenched powerful interests are, how ineffective government is, how... Maybe they're brighter than we were. Maybe well, we're, we're well, more naive. Government, government, too, has really become largely dysfunctional yeah. in many, many ways. I think everybody's... I think we... Most think. of us are kind of cynical now about government. Yeah, and, and we what did. I, I, I'm speaking for myself. Yeah. Um, I'm cynical. I'm frustrated. I want them to put us ahead of them, right. their, their beliefs. You know, just last night, you know, hearing all that stuff after Obama spoke. Yeah. And finally right. just turned off the TV, for God's sake, you know, and just got tired of it. But, yeah, and we're entrenched in wars that people have different cultural 
beliefs that we do, and of course we think that we were the best and everybody should be like us, and that they don't think that way. And of course they're a threat, um, a very small group. I feel so sorry for my Muslim friends yeah. who, who carry this mantle on them because of people like Christians have David Koresh and James Jones and stuff like that. Well, that doesn't mean most of us who are Christians believe the way they did any more than most of our Muslim friends believe the way that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and stuff like that do, but they carry that mantle on their shoulders at this point. And um, yet, here we are, you know, with all these young men coming back names and stuff like that, um, sort of fighting this war that is like Vietnam. We're not going to win it, I don't think. If you want to read what's next, read the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. We're just marching along. Well, we were told today that the Army definitely is interested in uh, some of the advanced technology that is happening in developing robots that will become our defending armies. Well, and we see that already with the use of drones increasingly. Yeah, yeah. You know. but these are, you know, like those games that you see, you know. Well, you don't. But they're, they're going to have the same fight. ones we are. Trench but they will to, be trench to trench, and they like, won't have they do. Can you see a couple in the far futures? Uh, and the wife is crying. The husband comes home, and she, he says, "What are you crying about? They drafted our robot." <laughs> <laughs> right, but the important point, I mean, to go back to, I think Sally's comment is that um, the other side of those robots will be actually flesh and blood human beings, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, right. as 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 so our like, right? Yeah. Well, even those people that fly the drones. You know, there's, there's people behind those yep. that do damage, you know. And it damages them, too. So yeah. I think this is course. an indication how the society <coughs> changes, how it constantly <coughs> changes. And these decades that we're talking about, there are events that are at work here that do change this whole tenor of the society. I think, the, as we were talking about the 60s, all the terrible tragedies that occurred in the 60s, uh, the deaths of these wonderful people who were going to try and change things, that's what hardened us, that's what made us cynical, that's what made us rebel, that's what propelled us into the next decades and all the protests that we have, so that each one of these decades produces yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure you think that that's happening now with Afghanistan and Iraq. And there's a whole group of people who feel the same cynicism. Sure. And right. who? But I think the absence of a draft is the biggest difference oh, yes. between yes. Vietnam yeah. and Afghanistan Absolutely. and Iraq. It is yeah. a big difference. Because the stories that you're telling about, it seems like everyone in this room personally experienced um, someone serving or the fear of serving, where it, as, um, that is a very localized, small percentage of people's experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan, which then changes the stakes and um, wanting to bring the troops home. It's, right. it's more, an, and it's an abstraction for most people rather than um, right. an immediate concern. Mm -hmm. My dad yeah. said, every time we have a war, that changes society. Society changes with a war. And so... I think that's correct. World War you know, One, then World War Two, Korean War was kind of a smaller war, but still, yeah. the things, they tend to bring about changes in society. I remember him just saying that. And probably more things happened as change in the Korean War than we're really even aware of, because it hasn't really been, it's been a small slice in history that hasn't really been explored as much. But we're still dealing with the consequences of it because of what's right. going on in North Korea, and North Korea exactly. could be the ones that do drop the bomb on us or right. do do something horrible. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very unstable. And so, as well, much of a worry you. as Al Qaeda and uh, what's there. the Taliban and stuff like that. But I don't know if it was naive on my part, but I really felt in the 60s, even after, well, really more after Kennedy died because I was just a sophomore in high school when he died, that I could see changes. I could see that if there were enough people protesting that suddenly Walter Cronkite was talking about getting out of the war. Right. So little by little, the things that people were doing did seem to make a difference. We didn't solve all the problems, but there was, you were getting closer toward what you wanted. And I don't know that young, your students now can see that. No. Well, and they feel they can't, so why bother? Well, well, yeah, I also think that there's, I mean, collectively, a disinvestment in the common good in public culture. I mean, I think 
uh, I, you know, there, there, cause there's a sense that, I mean, I certainly know with my own family, um, participating in civil rights was about a sense of justice and fairness, even if your own community wasn't the community that was being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, you might have a really progressive father or husband, but you understood that other women were restrained, and so fighting for women's rights was a part of a broader um, improvement of, of, the, of public life for people. And I will say that I think collectively we've decided that the public sphere isn't very important, and people are interested in um, private lives mattering in a way that, that the public good has really been eroded. And so I almost feel as though my students haven't really been encouraged to think of themselves as members of a broader community, you know, that their fate is intimately intertwined with the fates of other people who they may never meet in a way that I think you actually understood instinctively growing up um, in the 50s and 60s that uh, your fates were intertwined. Um, and so I, I don't know, it makes me really sad. I think it's, it's, it's Well, do you think some of that is due to all the, um, you know, the Facebook and the Twitter and the, they don't even know people, right. they, they have friends, but they might not even have ever met these people that are friends, and that that kind of desensitizes you to the, I mean, we actually knew the people we, Right. We and the 60s with. was the first time that it was really brought face to face with us, because us, you know, right. like in your class, when television sure. came on and right. the body Absolutely. count was listed every night yeah. and we're all sitting there watching guys hacking through forests and stuff like that right. and that was the first time that didn't happen in World War II. People right. listened to the radio and right. stuff like that but it was really brought home to us and, and the riots, all of that stuff that normally would have, nobody, not the general population would have known about, right. now everybody knew right. about it. Now we're used to it. Yeah, we're desensitized. We're, we're used to yeah. it. And to be perfectly honest, maybe I'm being naive, but we do see things about Iraq and Afghanistan. We're and numb. maybe we, but not, we're I don't numb. know, it just seems like not as much as we really got hit with it in during Vietnam. Or maybe, like you said, well, we because that was well, the we first had it all time. Over and over yeah. 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 You become numb yeah. 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 over and over and over. But the media I mean, attacking you during Vietnam, that was the beginning of all of that. And everyone had a television set. Yeah. And, and things were expanding, and the news programs were changing. All the, mm -hmm. uh, the networks were uh, kind of uh, were changing their whole approach to broadcasting. Uh, there, there were. Uh, pundits that came on the scene and, and were spreading what they wanted to say. And that became, that became part of our, what we recognized and saw. And the more they did, the more they did. And now we've reached to this point where... Well, I suspect we're probably uh, arrived about at the same philosophy as your students. I mean, yeah. just we're both uh, not active. We've seen it before. Well, I think now they haven't seen it before, but somehow yeah. through age we. Don't yeah. you find it puzzling that we can't seem to learn from yeah. history? <laughs> no. I, mean, it, I mean, yes, that's great. But You're people, people right. aren't taking to the streets about where we are right now. You know, there doesn't seem to, there seems yeah. to be. Well, any, I think we recognize that it just goes on. We've seen it so often. There that's seems to be a resignation. Yeah, yes, the only exactly. community that I think is. Um, that you still see mobilizing is immigration rights groups. You know, so in like 2006, um, especially as a number of states were passing very, very restrictive and punitive and, and really difficult immigration laws, you started seeing in a number of communities in the Southwest these like hundreds of thousands of people protesting. And I think, you know, Obama's speech last night even indicated that immigration reform, I think, is it's on the but we've gone through that protest too. Yeah, mm -hmm. right here in California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not going yeah. away. Right. But no. you know, it's a positive thing, yeah. and this is. I mean, I've read quite a bit about it. The whole gay marriage. I mean, who yeah. would have thought in 1950, 1960, even 2007? Yeah, I mean, right. talk about fast. Yeah. And that's great, but the, normally these things take years right. and years and years. And in fact, I remember reading, I think it was Time Magazine, doesn't matter where, that a lot of the gay groups, gay rights groups, 
just got all over these guys who were going, taking lawsuits and pushing for gay marriage. Right. They said, well, maybe you'll get this or that, but you'll never get that. Right. And 10 years later, there it is in half of the country. Right. And I would think that would give your students, whether they're gay or not, a sense of, you know, young people can't change the world. Right. Yeah, Emma, though it's interesting to think about how that comes about, right? You know, um, because we certainly didn't see, like, sit-ins. You know, we didn't see gay couples just occupy justices right. of the peace and insist on getting married. You know, it. Um, I think it's tactics change. Yes. Tactics change. Yes. But, but also, I think a lot of. I think it. Um, sort of that old slogan: "The personal is political." You know, I yeah. think so much yeah. of what happened is gay people came out, and exactly. all of a sudden people knew. Oh my knew God! I'm related nephews. to this person. Exactly. How can I hate them for their sexual practices if they're my daughter-in-law's exactly. best friend? You so, know? so, absolutely. It's, so it's less a form of public protest as much yeah. as a form of um, personal relationships mm -hmm. transforming hearts and minds and so I think it's incredibly um, wonderful and, in, and an important civil rights issue that's finally having its day but it's taken a really different form than than the much more public um, expressions of injustice that we've seen in the 60s yeah. and 70s. But she's right that it's yeah. happened <clears throat> so quickly yeah. because I have a niece that came out as gay she's 30 God, 33 now yeah. she came out almost 20 years ago and yeah. I mean she was but she came out hard, yeah. and she was crucified yeah. here in high yeah. school. And you know, my brother and his wife were up there all the time. And I mean, I mean, what she went through was horrible. My mother said it's a phase, you know. I said nobody would choose to do this, you yeah. know. No, this is right. not a choice. Oh, boy, I, I really learned that. <clears throat> so she tried to here. I, <clears throat> she tried to start a gay straight club. Yeah for a dialogue, and it was up in San Marino, in, um, up near Pasadena, and the San Marino Tribune came out with gays attempting to take over San Marino High School. And my mother is going, oh my God, you know, it's my granddaughter, and what did my friends find out, and all this kind of stuff, and I said, now, now she, my niece is my nephew, mm -hmm. she's had mm -hmm. a transgender I mean, oh, family. Yeah. So, you know, surgery and everything, and um, so when I think in the 15 years since all of this happened, a lot of how much movement. has changed so quickly yeah. in this one area. Right. Yeah. Really, really did. Yeah. I think we're probably going to go in a while, so I wanted to just ask uh, to maybe discuss the music of the 60s a little more. Yeah. Yesterday we had a, an icon of the, that yeah, era. Yeah, uh, I, I know, I know. And yeah. I can only remember going, for, well, coffee houses were very yeah. popular in the 60s. Yeah. And used to go because they had folk musicians who played right. and sang and so forth, and you had your coffee. Um, and I would say a large percentage of the music was Pete Seeger's music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or traditional yeah. folk songs that yeah. were being adapted. Well, Inside Lewin yeah. Davis, that, yeah. that I loved. A lot of I people did didn't like it. Yeah. But that, to me, is the 60s, the early 60s, bringing that back. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and um, yeah, I mean, so much of the music is about um, workers, and it's about labor organizing, yeah, and protests. about economic protest. inequality and yeah. protest. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so folk music really got a certain zeitgeist. And then it, and then it flips, like, overnight to the Beatles. Right, 64. We had Motown yeah. first, and then the Beatles. Yeah. Motown was like 64. But the Beatles created such yeah. a change overnight. I mean, it was like it was like a wave of... But there was a whole lot of music that was coming out of the South. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was all black music, yeah. which is Race influenced music. the whole... Yeah. Yeah. Joan Baez well, there's, and... No, there's no I'm guy talking about... No, no, I was yeah. just saying if others... But, that, yeah. Joan yeah. Baez was, you know, Bruce was... Uh, um, Dylan's era and all of that music. And then there yeah. was Springsteen right. and all of Springsteen that. But the black later. music also influenced a lot of these other folk singers, oh, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there, I think as you're talking about family and if you have a family or a personal relationship, I grew up in Southern California. I knew a few black people. I loved their music. I went to their music. I remember going to James Brown, and my mother, I lied to my mother. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I mean, I went with several girlfriends. And there weren't very many blondes there. Yeah. And people just embraced, we liked the same music, and I really think, in a lot of ways, for civil rights, that opened things up. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I like the music, if I like 
these people that like the music, I'm really not that different from them. That's a very good point. Music yeah. brings people together. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah or, or it has yeah. in it the has. past. Yeah. <laughs> oh it God. seems to always heal a lot of um, issues and problems. You, know, you get people to sing together and, you know, and enjoy the music. They seem to forget all those differences. Yeah. For a while. We weren't married at the time, but my husband and I went to a Nancy Wilson concert in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And um, back then you got dressed up to go to a, uh -huh. a concert, you know. And so we had, he had on a suit and I had on my nicest dress. And we got there and the audience was probably 95% black. And um, these women were dressed, I felt like a little brown wren. They had, <laughs> and they had hats on, mm -hmm. and the men had, shirt sure tabs. Um, they had um, suits, like peach suits with a peach shirt and a peach tie and peach color shoes and their peach fedora, and it was just amazing. And we looked so stupid. <laughs> yeah. But, it but was you like the same music. Yep. Yeah. The music does bridge many places. Yeah. Well, maybe that's part of the troll in the Middle East and in Asia that we don't have this music that brings us together. Oh, I, I, I lived in the Middle East for a while and, and they do have the same music and they follow our music and they follow the music of this culture and that culture and they incorporate it all. And you know, it's, almost the, it's always the younger generation who's bringing this together. Well, there's uh, not some that of those same. cultures, they are not, uh, not allowed music. Right? Or at least not Western music. Their young people find ways. Just like in China, mm -hmm. they pirate the music on the internet. Well, it's even in Iran. Yeah. Well, not, not quite the same as our black music and how we... Well, no, yeah, because we, we had a much more open society and people were just stealing their music anyway, left yeah. and right. Yeah. And a lot of people made a lot of money from their music too. Yep. Different society, but... Yeah. But I feel I feel like with my grandkids and so forth, they they think rap is pretty neat, mm -hmm. and I and I don't understand it at all. <laughs> it's right. like, to me, it's like not music, but it is music. I'm not sure what it is, but I can remember with my parents when I was um, like 14, 15, and they thought rock and roll was sure. the same oh. kind of problem. Right. Oh yeah. Right. 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 For devil's music. Yes. Yeah. And from my understanding, although please correct me if I'm wrong, as um, at a certain point in the 1960s, there was a tremendous distrust of mainstream news outlets or mainstream newspapers in terms of being forthcoming about what was happening in Vietnam or being critical enough about uh, what was happening in the U.S. And so music and uh, underground magazines and like the, the young people found alternate sites for political awareness and political commentary and that music often functioned in that way. Um, that is what my history books tell me, <laughs> At least. Yeah. Um, which makes sense to me. You know, if you constantly are seeing Robert McNamara on the news telling you that Vietnam is going really well, and you know for a fact because of your own family that it's not, that you might start. Yeah, there was a lot of underground yeah. publications, uh, yeah. Haight Ashbury, and yeah, this. Yeah. you know, things were happening all over. Nobody was afraid to start um, a new resource, a new outlet of. of information. Yeah. I, yeah. I just thought of the, con this is a little yeah. after the 60s, but um, mm -hmm. people might not believe this of me because I'm more conservative now than I used to be, but I belonged to the ACLU and in, when Nixon had his plumbers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went out and got petitions and I had people sign for his impeachment. And I had a good job and was, you know, had family behind me, so if someone fired me, I wasn't going to be on the street. I could not get a lot of people to sign it because they were afraid mm -hmm. that they would get back to their boss and they could lose their job. Mm -hmm. And I, so you were talking about before the economy. Yeah. I think the economy has a little bit to do with it. And I think there are probably people from the 60s who did not have enough, you know, were too close to the, the edge as far yeah. as economics that you can't put your neck out there. I mean, right. I couldn't believe that people were afraid to sign <coughs> a petition with the First Amendment and all that, but they yeah, were. Well, that's like the kids asking me to right. take SDSU. Yes, S exactly. Um, not SDSU. SDS, yeah. um, SDS out of their mm -hmm. the high school right. and the college mm -hmm. yearbook mm -hmm. as an activity. Right. Um, it's the same kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, it's just, it's some, some of that has roots in the 50s because I remember like this and very stuff. early in the 50s going um, with friends, they were going to what was called a hootenanny, mm -hmm. where a lot of this, all this underground music and all this 
yeah. folk music was right. coming from communists and my, socialists. Yeah, but and my father always said to me, he didn't say don't go. He just looked at me and he said, don't sign your real name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he turned out to be exactly well, people right. do that now. They put down their real email address. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Pete Seeger was blacklisted from television until 1967. Oh, yeah. You the, know, so the, the, the McCarthy yeah. anti-communism thing. Yeah, my, co I mean, yeah. my cousin was part of it. He he got blacklisted yeah. Yeah. as a writer. Mm -hmm. That was that was one of the most devastating eras in our history. With this with the blacklisting. Times change. We're speechless at the moment. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? What are you, they what want are you to doing ask? with this? <laughs> we're not sure. Too late to ask. <laughs> <laughs> we're not on tape. We we're going, going to over then. to you, Allison. No, I think it's, it's Ollie. Um, I mean, I would love to have a coffee if it's easy to do. We, we're going to yeah. try to um, get the uh, at, at least uh, just the the vocal part of this and put it on a CD and give it to you and keep it in our records and such. We kind of would like to, we've got a lot of, you know, personal histories that right. we can talk about in this organization and we really should start keeping some kind of records of it. And this equipment doesn't cost us anything because we borrow it from extension. So hoping this all works. And we could do, because I was in the business of recording talks for a long time, we can hook up a little simple audio recording system right here for talks or at U Club or whatever, and providing the person who's the presenter gives their permission, right. mm -hmm. we could we could have all of those archived. Yeah, and we got the PowerPoints, if they use PowerPoint, you use PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So you can put together a little package of, Make our own of an audio with a PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. I think the World War II group has done some things for the we started to do that, yeah, and there's going to be another series of World War II classes uh, in the fall. Good. A lot of, a lot of people want to take those classes. A tremendous amount of people want to take those classes, and we, I, I guess we still have a few relics of people who <laughs> have sure, survived. Sure all the relics. <laughs> Have to start on the Vietnam War. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to get the guy that, uh, who wrote un, was Unbroken, I'm Zamperini. I'm oh, Zamperini. He He's was still alive. alive. He but is he, still alive. But he was very sick for a while. No, I just talked to his daughter about six months ago, and he's back out on the, the tours. Well, if you giving know talks. his daughter, then you're the person to get him here. Yeah, well, he wanted a lot of money, like well, $15,000. Oh, oh, well. He deserves really. it. I hey, wouldn't would it be kind of hard for him to talk for two hours? I bet not. He's a dynamo. He's 96 years old, and he, he'd let, he'd, he'd, if you let, he let him talk, he'll talk all day. I mean, it's a Andrew miracle Andrew he Lee. survived that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a horrible yeah. situation. You know, this is off the topic, but I just did books on tape on his book, and we had the World War II class where the man from German, the German soldier was yeah. talking about, you know, dressing up as an American and ha, ha, ha. I think he had a nervous laugh, laughter. Mm. It was all I could do not to throw an eraser at him. Thinking <laughs> of what Zamperini had gone, gone through, through this guy stealing cakes and pies and stuff in Germany. Yeah. So. Right. Yes. There used to be a lot of uh, Holocaust survivors living in Orange County, but I think well, they... Well, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. That would be a whole other but that's all part of mm -hmm. right. the and World War II. And, yeah. Right. And there's, there's a lot of uh, records of that, true. Yeah, but it's always interesting to hear people's personal story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we'll see how this turns out. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it did. Thank you for coming out. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much yeah. for participating. This, this is awesome. excellent. I don't know if you got anything that you really felt you can use, but if not, can always write a few questions and write. Now, are you planning we'll to do another out. era? Uh, that has not been discussed yet. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do have, I like the 70s. <laughs> so I don't know if we're getting too close well, to Well, what present. era would you pick off the top I mean, of your head? I think the 70s are really through. fascinating. They're just so profoundly depressing. You know, I've taught a class on the 70s. They are and depressing. <laughs> it's just by, you know, with my undergrads, by like week four, we're all ready to like slit our wrists. <laughs> we're yeah. so depressed at all of the 
hard things that happened in the 1970s. So you're doing on the, the mid 21st century. The, the mid, like, like in anticipation of, like, yeah, like a looking future, at, looking, looking, looking forward. What, what will yeah. life be like? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's right, you know, if, if provided that um, there's still inhabitable land that hasn't been like flooded or, <laughs> you know, been devastated by. But those are great questions. Yeah, yeah. but if you want to do a course on the seventies, I want to talk to you right after this. Okay. Because the calendar is getting very crowded. Okay. Yeah. Believe it or not. No, that's. I mean, that's, but that's also, that's good. There should be there's other uh, yeah, ways sure. of presenting it, too. Yeah. I think so. What happened in the 70s that's so depressing? Well, the end of Vietnam, Watergate, what? the oil crisis.